In-depth sports coverage from The Athletic is now just £1 a month with an introductionary offer. See the link in the description to sign up. Since the beginning of the 2015-16 season, Chelsea have sanctioned 90 different loan deals, scattering players across Europe and beyond. It's a satellite system with a traditional function, providing a crucial next step and first team minutes for developing players, but it's also a strange netherworld, full of quirky anecdotes, unseen careers and hidden value. Chelsea's loan army is complex and fascinating, and it also has its own WhatsApp group. At the time of his release in 2018, Mate Delach was Chelsea's longest-serving player, having signed for the club in 2010. Inter Zaprizic were paid a reported £2.5 million for a goalkeeper who had, even at 17, already been called up to Croatia's senior international squad. Each year, he would faithfully return to Cobham for pre-season before bouncing out on loan. Between 2010 and 2017, Delac would have spells in the Netherlands, Czech Republic, Portugal, back in his native Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia twice, France and Belgium. And finally, in 2018, following his contract's expiration, he packed his bags, said his digital farewells on WhatsApp and joined Danish side AC Hersens. To some, Delac is a punchline. A victim of scarce opportunity and someone who ultimately wasn't quite good enough to be a Chelsea player for real. A more reasoned analysis, however, would pitch him as part of a system which isn't built solely to supplement the first team. In fact, the mistake with Chelsea's low knees has always been to believe in the primacy of that objective. Another fallacy is to see their array of talent at home and abroad as a figurative cue leading to Stamford Bridge. In fact, very few of the players in Chelsea's loan system could claim to have been denied an opportunity. It seems unlikely, for instance, that players like Christian Cuevas, Danilo Pantic or Nathan were only a lucky break away from enjoying Premier League level careers. Which of course isn't to say that Chelsea erred by signing them in the first place. In fact, the club have actually shown themselves to be extremely adept at manoeuvring their pieces around the board, collecting loan fees, stage managing players' profiles, reputations and value and finally, where appropriate, timing their departures. In simple terms, they recognise the existence of a market which is detached from their footballing aims. While he was in the system, attacking midfielder Nathan provided a good example. A Brazilian youth international who joined from Atletico Paranese in 2015 for just £3.6 million, he spent two years on loan at Vitesse before splitting the 2017-18 season between Amiens in France and Portugal's Bulnes. In July 2018, he was sent back to Brazil on a two-year loan move to Atletico Mineiro before in July 2020 making that move permanent for £2.7 million. So without any privileged information, it's still easy to see the clubs working. How in the first instance he was provided a soft landing in European football at Vitesse, a club with whom Chelsea enjoy a long-standing technical partnership, before he was advanced into a more testing environment in France. It was not a success, and that seems to have instructed a different process, one designed to help Nathan recover his value and reputation, rather than prepare him in any way for English football. In 2018, when he returned to his native Brazil, Chelsea only made a £900,000 loss on what they originally paid, and did so in the depressed post-Covid market. So, while easy to dismiss this as a failure, the episode really demonstrated how robust Chelsea's loan system is, and how sound their accompanying theories are. In essence, they had speculated on a gifted attacking player from a fashionable part of the football world. They paid a small fee to sign him, subsidised his wages with loan agreements and positioned him at teams which may have allowed his skills to develop and his value to appreciate. Neither really happened and yet, from a financial perspective, Chelsea will most likely have earned a small profit from their relationship with the player. Not bad for a worst case scenario. And of course, the ability to do that is very much a privilege of their position. There aren't many clubs who could have afforded to commit nearly £4 million to a slow-yielding asset. Fewer still with the capital to do so again and again over many years and with dozens of other players. Nevertheless, and despite Chelsea's loan network often being the subject of public mirth, they've always been both an important protection against financial fair play and a part of compensation for their inability to expand Stamford Bridge or improve their static matchday income. And there are more vivid examples of the dynamic in action. Torgan Hazard arrived at Stamford Bridge in 2012 for less than £500,000. 
Three years later, after a successful loan to Borussia Mönchengladbach, which according to Transfermarkt was worth in the region of £1.4 million, he was sold to the Bundesliga club for £7.2 million. And Christian Atsu is another. He joined Chelsea from Porto in 2013 for a reported £2.7 million and would never make a first-team appearance. He would join Newcastle in 2017 for £6.75 million, a not insignificant profit, but after loans at Vitesse, Bournemouth, Malaga, Everton, and as a precursor to his permanent move, St James's Park. Viewed from those angles, Azard and Atsu are less players and more football bonds, little industries even. Add to that list Mario Pasalic who was bought for £2.25 million in 2014 and then, after five different loans, sold to Atalanta for £13.5 million. Or Kennedy, who is on his fourth European loan. Or Lucas Piazza, who's recently embarked upon his seventh. Or Thomas Callas, who's also had seven separate loans before being sold to Bristol City for over £8 million and a profit. In the abstract, Chelsea are the fully stocked garage of European football, with tools for hire and eventual sale to those who need them. Their loan network is an economy of its own. And no, they have never been a club of optimal efficiency, either in the buying or selling of players, or just in the identification of their future value. Where they do lead the market, however, is in the recognition of a footballer's broader worth and what the best ways are to capitalise on that value. The Athletic is in-depth sports coverage that helps fans see the game from every angle. And Tifo is delighted to be able to offer full access to The Athletic now for just £1 per month. See the link in the description for details of this introductory offer. For football fans, that's access to the writing of journalists dedicated to your team, plus David Ornstein, Phil Hay, Daniel Taylor and many more. Not to mention over 400 full-time writers offering inside access and independent analysis of every team that you follow across every league that you care about. Get local expertise and unmatched league-wide perspective. The Athletics writers are in the bubble, on the field and behind the scenes as it all happens. Catch up, go deep, and join the conversation on the most important happenings in sports.